Well, I've been waiting a long time to say this. Welcome to heaven, or at least to our study of heaven, based on this book by David Alcorn. Now, during the course of our study, I won't make a lot of references to the book. Instead, I've used it to help guide the organization of our study and give some suggestions of scriptures to read. Uh, so it won't be necessary for you to have a copy of this book. However, I think if you did go ahead and get a copy, uh, the, your experience is going to be just that much better. I don't have permission uh, to uh, quote a lot from the book, and so, um, as I said, it'll, it'll be more in the background, um, but uh, I do recommend it as a study of this subject of heaven. And Of course, uh, along with all of these uh, matters of the end times and heaven and hell and all of these uh, parts that we learned in our Revelation study were called eschatology. Um, it's an interesting part of theology because people tend to be very passionate about their views, but their views tend to be based on a lot less evidence than other parts of theology. So what we study is um, going to be uh, based on fewer Bible verses and, and, and more on Bible verses that are maybe a little obscure or difficult to interpret. And so in this study, what we really need is a lot of forbearance and uh, charity toward one another because um, I, I'm going to say things that you'll disagree with. Alcorn says things that I disagree with. And um, we can note the differences without um, trying to convince one another to accept one view or another. I'm not going to um, say that my, what, all of my thoughts are the right thoughts, uh, but instead I've, I've tried the best I can over the years to come up with um, a coherent understanding of what the Bible says about the end times. So I, I really hope that you will make use of the comments section here on this YouTube page. Um, I think there's probably a like and a subscribe button and all of that stuff that, that you can do to better communicate with me what your thoughts are and, um, well, with the other members of the class as well, or the group. So without further introduction, let's go ahead and get started with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we're excited to begin this study, and we pray that it will be fruitful in many ways. But in one way that I can anticipate is that we, we gain a better sense of what heaven is going to be like, and we gain a greater desire to be there, and we gain a, a, a greater desire to include others and to bring them to heaven with us. Thank you for this time. Thank you for these friends. Guide us by your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I said at the beginning, one of the things that we're going to borrow from Alcorn is his introduction of this study. And as you can see on page one of your handout, he's got it very heavily uh, outlined and organized. So, we're going to start here with part one, a theology of heaven, and underneath that, section one, realizing our destiny, that is, how do we get to heaven, and then chapter one, which asks the question, are you looking forward to heaven? To begin, we're going to look at Philippians chapter one, verses 21 to 26, and we're going to see here that Paul looked forward to going to heaven. The other thing we'll notice in trying to answer that question is, if you aren't looking forward to going to heaven, if that's not a, an expectation in you that is palpable, a hope that wells up frequently in your mind and in your spirit, um, why not? And one of the likely reasons is that... Um, We've been lied to by the enemy who doesn't want us to think about heaven. 
Okay, let's go to Philippians first, and we'll see uh, Paul writing about his desire and anticipation of going to heaven. Philippians chapter 1, starting with verse 21. Actually, let's start with 20. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but, I, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. I've, I am to go on living in this body. This will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. Now, we need to understand what's going on here. Paul is, at the time of this writing, under arrest in the city of Rome. He is scheduled to appear before the Roman Emperor Nero, who has shown no love for Christians. And um, yet Paul expresses a belief that he will survive this encounter with Nero. And in this particular part of um, Philippians, Paul is talking to them about all the things that he has suffered in the course of, of his service to Christ. And as a part of that, he's, he's comparing those sufferings to the glory of heaven. So, uh, on page one, was Paul looking forward to going to heaven? Yes, I think uh, obviously he was, in part because life on earth was difficult. Um, and also that he knew whether he lived or died, Christ would be exalted in his body. So we look at verse 21 and we ask the question, what did Paul say was the purpose of his life? And I believe what he said here is that his purpose is uh, was fruitful labor. Fruitful labor. That in his service to Christ and to Jesus' people, uh, that he intended to... Um, produce spiritual fruit. He, uh, he expressed this in verse 22, and then um, in verse 18, which we didn't read, in verse 25, which he did, he expects to continue with the church in their progress to their joy in the faith. So, um, Paul did not see life as a sorrowful obligation um, he said it is to be characterized by two things, progress and joy. So achievement and happiness are to be part of our life of faith. Those aren't interludes in life. That's what the Christian life is to consist of. Now the second question is, if that was the purpose of Paul's life, what was the purpose of Paul's death? And he said here that... To die would be gain. That is a personal benefit to him. So let's look at that word or that phrase in verse 22. Fruitful labor. What did you think that phrase means? I think it means that good and godly results are attained through faithful service. Now, why do I think that? I think that because this same Paul who wrote these words 
also wrote to the Corinthians, and he said um, in chapter 3 and verse 7, in comparing himself to Apollos, the planter and the waterer, he said, So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who makes things grow. So God is the one who makes us fruitful, who blesses our labor with results. As we look at verses 22 to 24, Paul says he was in a dilemma to choose which he preferred. Yes, he was in a dilemma to choose which he would preferred, but not which he would seek. Paul did not um, think that, that he had the power to end his life. He, he didn't have the power to extend his life. At this point, in a, in a worldly sense, in a physical sense anyway, Paul is literally in the hands of Caesar. And so, yet he's, he's just not certain which he prefers at this point. One thing in favor of life was to be able to continue to serve the Philippian church. But on the other hand, one thing in favor of death was to that, that being with Christ would be better even than that. So great to live and serve the Corinthian or the, the Philippian church, better still to pass on and to go to heaven to be with the Lord Jesus. And so Paul is really expressing here a very faithful position. He's saying, you know, this looks desperate, but I'm really in a win-win situation. If Caesar chooses to spare my life, then I win because I get to continue to work with you good people, and I get set free. If Caesar decides to take my life, I still win because leaving this life and being with Christ is better than continuing to live it. Now, Paul was in a dilemma in an emotional sense because he said, I'm, I don't know which to choose. I am torn between the two. But in either case, what Paul wanted most was in verse 20, that now, as always, Christ shall be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. So to resolve the dilemma, Paul decided he would choose to continue to live and work with the believers. This would result in overflowing joy, both for him and for the church. Now, history tells us that Paul did not survive this trial by Nero, and that he was put to death in the manner befitting his Roman citizenship. He was beheaded. Now, Paul was looking at the benefits of dying and going to heaven. And um, borrowing a little bit from author John Piper, I see um, in Scripture at least four of what I would call death benefits. The first is perfection. Hebrews 12, 22 to 23. Jot this down in the margin of your paper. Number one, perfection. Hebrews 12, 22 to 23. When we go to heaven, we leave behind this earthly life of sin, of temptation, of compromise, of having to live in the presence of evil. And we become perfect in, because of God. Second death benefit, pain relief. Revelation 21.4. Pain relief. We get relieved of the physical aches and pains of this life. Revelation 21.4. Third death benefit, rest. Rest. We get rest for our souls. 
according to Revelation 6, 9 through 11. And the fourth and final benefit is a deep sense of being home. A deep, abiding, eternal sense of being at home with God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8. So, Paul then demonstrates a, a clear desire to go to heaven, but he chose out of duty and obedience to prefer to remain on earth and in, in service with and to the Philippian believers. So Paul wanted to go to heaven. There's no doubt about that. Now we need to ask the question, who is invested in making you not want to go to heaven? Who would that be? Well, let's, we've got three passages we'll look at very briefly. John, that's Gospel of John, chapter 8 and verse 44. Now before I read that, let me tell you what's going on here. John chapter 8 is a series of confrontations between Jesus and the Pharisees or their cronies, their supporters. And this um, verse is one point of that debate between Jesus and the religious leaders and their followers. And in this situation, the the Jews believed that they were children of Abraham, and, and not just by descent, but in, in every way possible. So they, um, they believed that, that that granted them special status. It made them um, uh, insecure in the sense that, that, that they had put a false hope on being children of Abraham, that, that that uh, he gave them a false sense of security. And Jesus wants to let the air out of that. And so in chapter 8, verse 44, he tells them who they are really children of. Chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus is talking to them and he said, You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he speaks, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So, set to the side the fact that, that Jesus is speaking to these Jewish people and he's trying to burst their bubble and that the false sense of security that they get from it and focus on what it tells us about Satan and what it says about Satan is that Satan is a big liar who wants to sell us on the big lie that heaven is not the place we want to be that this world is so much better so much more interesting Heaven is going to be deadly dull in comparison to this life, so have all the fun you want in this life, and don't bother with that heaven stuff. That's a lie. Let's turn to Revelation 13. And here we are being given a description of the beast from the sea. And... Um, this gives us more information about Satan, but also about what he's trying to do. Chapter 13 and verse 5. The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies, and to exercise his authority for 42 months. He opened his mouth to blaspheme God, to slander his name and his dwelling place, and get this, those who live 
in heaven. He's slandering God, but also slandering heaven and those who live there. So, what do we note here? The beast of the sea was empowered to, uh, to slander God and his name, his dwelling place, and those who live in heaven. Those three things. Excuse me. So Satan is, is going to lie to us specifically here about heaven. Final scripture. We're going back to Isaiah, the book we've just completed. Isaiah chapter 14. And verses 11 to 15. Now, uh, this part of Isaiah, if you look back at verse 4, is a taunt against the king of Babylon. So it's kind of unusual passage here. This is um, things that the people of God would say to taunt or ridicule uh, the king of Babylon. But there's a section here that takes on uh, a bigger scope and also fits with Jesus' teaching so that we think uh, that Isaiah here is talking about someone more powerful than the king of Babylon, uh, possibly, probably, Satan. So, Isaiah 14, starting with verse 11. All your pomp has been brought down to the grave, along with the noise of your harps. Maggots are spread out beneath you, and worms cover you. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn, you have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will sit, oh, excuse me, I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. But you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. In Luke chapter 16 and verse 18, no, not 16, chapter 10, verse 18. Let me double check that reference quick. Uh, can't read my own writing. Luke chapter 10 and verse 18. Yes. 10, 18. Luke 10, 18. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall from light, like lightning from heaven. It's a very short sentence, to the point. Jesus witnessed in his pre-human days the fall of Satan from heaven, an event which Isaiah describes. Even though the uh, banner over that section is a taunt against the king of Babylon, maybe Isaiah is comparing the king of Babylon to Satan, who thought he could surpass God. In his hubris, in his pride, he thought he could replace God. But he was defeated, as we find out in Revelation 12. He was thrown out of heaven. And because he is now an outcast, we can see why Satan would have an especially bad attitude about heaven. Now his ambition, as it's expressed here in a, in a kind of ridiculing way, a taunt, is that he was going to make it all the way to the top. He was going to replace God. And that sounds an awful lot like the people who tried to raise the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11.4. A kind of absurd ambition to raise themselves up to God instead of um, 
allowing God to raise them up by faith. He mentions here uh, the heights to which he aspired, but the depths at which he ended up. And he mentions the grave and the pit, and those are really synonymous things. Uh, the grave is the great equalizer, persons of great ambition and achievement die, persons of low ambition and achievement die, and everyone in between. The pit uh, is um, the lowest place to which any soul can sink. And so this is a contrast between the height of his ambition and the depth of his defeat. So given that fact, given the facts that Satan is a liar, that he is a slanderer of heaven specifically, that he was thrown out of heaven, I think we can very safely assume that Satan wants to keep all of us out of heaven as well. He wants to confuse us on this point. I'm going to ask you to turn over to page 2. We'll take just a moment for these items of reflection. And as we think about what we've learned so far, and about the subject of heaven in general, I'm going to suggest to you some of my thoughts. That's not so that you can use them as your own, but maybe uh, give you a place to start thinking and add to what you've decided in response to these questions. Top of page two. Give examples of things other people believe about heaven that make it seem like an undesirable place. Well, in the book, Alcorn refers to a, a pastor, uh, a person of theological training, who said he didn't want to go to heaven because it sounded boring. Sitting around on clouds and strumming harps didn't sound appealing to him at all. Not for a short time, not for eternity. Other people say, well, okay, I don't want to rest all the time either. That sounds boring. So part of our study is going to be to root out those kind of false thoughts and bring correction with true doctrine. Second question, what do you believe about heaven? And here you write in your own answer. Um, for example, I, I wrote, and we'll get to this in a couple of chapters, I believe the present heaven is a war council. The new heaven will be a place of unparalleled beauty and worship and fellowship. Third question, are you looking forward to going to heaven? That's the question that highlights and headlines this chapter. I answered for myself, yes. And in part, just because I'm weary of this world and the evil in it and the seemingly fruitless toil of this world, I'm concerned about what's coming next. And it would be nice to be relieved of these burdens. Next question, does, going, does looking to heaven, forward to heaven, sound like suicidal attitude? Does it sound like we have to hate this life? And the answer to that, I think, is no. But it does put this life in perspective. This life is not our only life. It's not even our best life. And so we need to be thinking about our eternal life as we live this one. Have you ever shared Paul's dilemma as we studied it in Philippians 1? I'd have to say not really. Um, if you have, how did you resolve those mixed feelings? Did you resolve them in the way Paul did? By defaulting to obedience and love for, obedience to God and love for one's fellow believers? Next, what reasons might Satan have for trying to discourage belief in heaven or confuse us about the Bible's teaching about heaven? I think Satan wants to deny us our hope. He doesn't want us to be people of hope. And this is part of his plan to distract, discourage, and defeat us. 
If we don't have a hope for heaven and this life is all we've got, we're going to live in an entirely different way, a more desperate and worldly way than if we believe we have a better home awaiting us. How many sermons or Bible studies have you heard that dealt with the subject of heaven? I had to say, I, I can't remember any that I've heard, uh, but I've preached uh, several, I think four at least. And what did I learn from them? I learned enough to eagerly anticipate this study and to look forward to heaven, but not enough to feel like I've mastered the subject. At this point, what would you say to someone who expressed a disbelief in heaven? What would you tell them, based on what you know right now? I would ask, if that person were a churchgoer, I would ask them, why bother? Why bother going to church? Why bother being a Christian? Why bother identifying yourself with Jesus if you don't think there's any benefit to it? If there isn't something more significant than this life, why do any of that stuff? It makes no sense. The last question, what are you hoping will happen to you or for you as a result of participating in this study? For myself, I want my knowledge to grow, but I think more important to me is to coalesce that into a daily vision, an emotion, a fixation of hope that will help me to endure times of suffering or discouragement. I also hope it will be a remedy to selfishness and also a means by which I can give hope to other people, particularly those in the household of faith, and to those outside to encourage them to consider Jesus and to become a believer so that they can join us, join me, in living forever with Jesus in heaven. Well, I think there's a world of good that can be accomplished through this study. My earnest prayer, my heart's desire for myself and for you is that as we study, we, we come together, but that coming together is not necessarily going to require us to agree on all the points. Instead, with tolerance, with forbearance, with a genuine love for one another that, that does not require um, a, a flat, uniform agreement, come to an, an understanding and an appreciation of heaven that transcends theology and gives us a, a hope to which we all can aspire. Thank you for starting this journey with me tonight, and I pray that uh, as God leads us forward, it will be into deeper understanding, deeper appreciation, and deeper love.